I was not aware of the sort of politics that I later became aware of, and that is race discrimination and so on. But I always had a keen sense of justice. I remember even as a little girl being very upset if anybody in the household shouted at our domestic people or if I saw people misbehaving in the streets and on the pavements. So I did have a sense of justice even then. If all petty apartheid disappeared tomorrow and grand apartheid remained, the West would certainly welcome this, undoubtedly. But I doubt if blacks inside South Africa would give tuppence. I didn't come from a liberal background. My father didn't, thought I was mad, I think, really. In fact, I often doubted whether he would have voted for me had he been living in a constituency where I was uh, fighting for a seat. Um, but well, on one occasion where I said I was sick of it and I was giving it up, I was amazed to hear this old man say, but why are you doing quite well? Which was the most he would ever say. I mean, mostly he'd said, what do you want it for? You know, the usual sort of Jewish way of, of, of denigrating what you were doing. What do you want it for? And uh, it was hard to explain to him that I just had a simple attitude towards justice and, and equal opportunity. Really, there was nothing very mystical about this. It was just a feeling that people were being unfairly treated. I understood um, just what it was doing to, to the lives of the black population in this country. Will the Honourable Minister tell us when it is his intention either to charge or release this man? I mean, I happen to be in an exceptional position because I was the only representative of the only party that was fighting apartheid unequivocally for 13 years. That's a long time. Well, now, those 13 years did mean a lot of hard work. There's no question about it. I attended trials. I attended inquests. I went to funerals of activists like Neil Agate, Steve Biko, Robert Sabukwe, Dr. Ribeiro, all people who had died at the hands of the special branch. You know, in those days, funerals replaced mass meetings which were banned. And it was there, listening to the speeches at funerals, that one could get an idea of the, the mood of the people and what was happening among the so-called masses. And I think we must make it clear to the government that these disastrous confrontations between the people of the townships, the police and the army must stop. The killings must stop. I'm not a person who bursts into tears at every sad story I hear, but I just get mad, furious. And I'm a doer, you know, I'd like to go out and see for myself, and I did, I did a lot of that. Now, what's, what's burning? What is burning? And I was able to expose a lot of things that were going on which otherwise would never have got to the press because of various laws which uh, prevented them from reporting what was happening. And the parliamentary platform was exempted from that law. When we give our story in Parliament, which we will be doing next week, I don't want anybody to say you only heard one side of the story because we're giving you every opportunity to put your side of the story. And your side, I must tell you, differs materially from the side that we have heard from, from the witnesses of the events of yesterday. Well, that could be so, but I'm not, I'm not prepared to comment on that. So the right. South African police are not prepared to talk to opposition members of parliament to answer questions as to what happened, to give their side of the story? I mean, we're not here for a confidential chat with you, General. We're here to seek information which can be given to the public, which I believe has, and my friends certainly believe, has the right to, to know what went on yesterday. This is all over the world, you realise that? Yes, yeah, right, yeah. It's not a secret little operation between the, the, the police of, of Utenhaag and, uh, and the, re, the black residents of Utenhaag. This has now become a major disaster of world uh, proportions. That, that we right, so we are giving you the opportunity of putting your point of view and your version of what happened. Because the version which Mr. Lafranchi gave in, in Parliament yesterday is very different from the version which we so far have heard in discussions with people last night 
and so far this morning. Now we have not been allowed to enter the township which we wish to do. Your police are there, the place is sealed off, it's like a military camp and we want to know can we go in to the township to see where the incident took place and to talk to some of the residents there. Mrs. Yusma, are you addressing the press now? No sir, I'm addressing you. For the last time, please leave the... Uh... I mean, a lot of people said that I was legitimizing Parliament by being there. And I said, well, that's all very well, but it's a very useful platform. And I used it, and the very people who criticized me for making the apartheid Parliament legitimate used every answer to every question that I put in Parliament abroad as publicity for the, for the cause against apartheid. Tell us when it is his intention. There was a uh, really strong debate on, and I was opposing government actions. There would be some anti Semitic crack or some interjection go back to Israel. What are you doing here? Go and stick your long Jewish nose into the Knesset. We don't need you here. That sort of thing. It didn't upset me very much. It didn't upset you? No, not at all. I, I'm only upset by uh, remarks from people I respect. Our policy is one which is called by an Afrikaans word apartheid. Accepting that there are differences between people. Dr. Favud was a most extraordinary man, I must say. I, I had the misfortune to have to confront him all alone. And he was really quite a frightening character. I think he terrified his own caucus, never mind me. Uh, I stood up to him because after the, 50, after the 61 election, when all my colleagues were wiped out, he said, I used to think the Progressive Party would mean something, but now, he said, I have written them off. And I shouted out, and the whole world has written you off, which he didn't like at all. He didn't like being stood up to by anybody, least, least of all me. And so I had a pretty torrid time alone. But Dr. Favud was the most frightening of them all. When Favud was assassinated, and I was in Parliament when that happened, and suddenly there was a sort of uproar at the other end. It was surrendous, and they dragged him along the passage, dropped him in front of me. Along came P.W. Borta, who was then Minister of Defence. And he was livid. His eyes were out on stalks, and his finger was in the air like that, and he stopped opposite me. He said, Yah! Does your answer the your liberalist? No, so long, so I will cry. And he dashed out again. I said, Good God, <laughs> Earth is the man talking about. And I said to the chap next to me, Did you hear that? He said, Yes, ridiculous. So I reported him to the secretary, Mr. MacFarlane of Parliament. And he said, That's a very serious matter. You're not allowed to threaten an MP. And I will tell Mr. Cropper, the speaker, which he did. And the next day, Klopper sent for me, and I walked into Klopper's room, and there was um, P.W. Water sitting. <laughs> and Klopper turned to him and he said, Well, Mr. Borta. And Borta said, Well, in terms of the rules of the house, I apologize. <laughs> and I lost my t I said, Do you expect me to accept an apology like that? And he said, Take it or leave it. <laughs> <laughs> accepted the very ungracious apology of P.W. Borta. I never spoke to him again. Never, ever. Forster was easier to deal with, really, than, um, than for Wood. Because, well, he was a lawyer who argued log logically. One didn't agree with what he was saying. But nevertheless, you know, he had a logical argument. And he respected people who argued logically against him. He once said that I was worth 10 United Party MPs. I said he'd underrated me. <laughs> but I could go and visit him, as I often did, pleading the case of detainees and their families uh, when he was in Pretoria I used, and even in Cape Town. And, and I always had access to him, I must say. He didn't like me. And we had no personal relationship, like having a game of golf together, for instance. We were both keen golfers at that time. But I mean, I had much easier relationship with him than I did with Dr. Favod. So, and with P.W. Borta, he was really my bete noir. Such an irascible bully. 
You couldn't argue logically with P.W. Borter. There's no need a debate for me. It is a fight. De Klerk was, of course, much more of a gentleman, um, and he would never be, you know, rude or, or, or aggressive the way um, P.W. Borter was. And I got on fairly well with him. I always believe he's not being given sufficient recognition for the role he played in a peaceful negotiated settlement. Well, I knew of Mandela from the Ravonia trial, um, and even the treason trial, of course, he was one of, the, one of the accused in the treason trial, but I'd never met him. I first met him on Robben Island in 1967. Helen Sosman, as you know, I think for 13 years, remained the only voice of uh, enlightenment in a parliament which was dominated by very conservative and reactionary um, uh, elements. And he did very well. He was very courageous. And uh, he condemned all forms of racism and oppression. And what was more was his regular visits to prisoners in jail. And um, so we have a lot of respect for Helen Sussman. He is my friend. I came out of Robben Island and I said to the press, that man's our last hope of a peaceful solution to our problems. And indeed it proved to be so, but many years later in 1990. I think South Africa is a better country than, than it was, undoubtedly, under apartheid. But it's essential to ensure that there are checks and balances to prevent abuses of power, I haven't changed that at all, and to thwart the ANC's announced intention, very dangerous, to control all the levers of power. You'll have seen that. In other words, you have to have an opposition to prevent a transition to a one-party state. South Africa must not, in the words of John Milton, sink into a muddy pool of conformity. And I believe that the sweet birds must continue to sing loud and long. I mean, I remember saying to somebody, if you're going to stay in this country, you've got to do something about it. No, I think I did a good job, and I'm pleased with that. I've got no regrets about that, but heroin, certainly not. I could consider that I had an opportunity, um, and I made good use of it. That I will say. I wasn't frightened of anything, you know. I think you're a heroine if you do something when you're dead scared. <laughs> and I wasn't dead scared. <laughs>